Good afternoon, Nerd Fam, and welcome back to Databricks Data and AI Summit here in sunny San Francisco. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be joined by Cube, a co founder and my fabulous co host today, John Furrier. John, this has been a really fun two days together. Great day. I mean, it's very technical, it's very nerdy culture Super here. Super nerdy. Yesterday we thought it was nerdy keynotes, so even more today with Mattayan. It's really good. I mean, Databricks is doing all the right moves, open source open data formats, essentially trying to scale up the category yeah. and builders, and I think it's all around governance and it's all about data. And it's a data shift, a platform shift, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting time. You don't know which way the wind's going to blow at any given day, so, but the good news is generative AI is where it's going, so it's uh, fun, <laughs> yeah. to fun to Super cover exciting. and fun to talk about. And we're excited to have a Cube alum, but a first timer with us. Robert, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. How has the show been for you? The show has been excellent. You know, I was just saying you guys before we started rolling, was that we're getting about 15 to 20 percent of the audience come and you know look at the demos and seriously consider a proposition, which allows them to manage their data, you know, really well. So it's really exciting. What does that What does that say to you? What does that signal to you when you're getting that significant of a percentage? Well, you know, six years back when we started the company, we thought that you know there's going to be more data, mm -hmm. there's going to be more complexity and more data systems, and there's not going to be enough talent in the market to actually manage those data systems and provide the right business outcomes of the data. And I think that is exactly how the market is playing, with one caveat. We did not expect that data is going to grow so exponentially. We thought it'll grow 2x year over year, but you know, in the last year, I've seen you know, data growth of 4x and 5x, and now it's suspected that it'll become you know, 7 to 8x in the next two years. What's the value proposition that's driving your business? Is it the governance piece, the observability, managing the data? What are some of the key features of, that make you guys uh, successful right now? So I think you know, always the intent for the enterprise has been to you know, manage these different data islands you know, where they have implemented different data systems. The challenge was that you know, governance of the, the previous generation was very static in nature. It was you know, define it once, catalog all the information, and then hand it over to the self-serve analytics folks. But unfortunately, what has happened is that you know, that's too far down the supply chain. If you think of you know, data as a supply chain, the places where it gets created is towards the application in the landing zone, in the transformation and the ETLs that you do. Pipelines have almost become the lifeblood of the modern enterprise. And so monitoring the data pipelines, making sure that the trains are running on time, data is very reliable, and you're doing it at a reasonable cost is something that has now become extremely important, especially in this you know, multi-cloud, multi-technology world. So Savannah and I were talking all yesterday and this morning with the other analysts on the CUBE mm -hmm. research, is that there's another complex factor that's in the market. I want to get your reaction to this if you don't mind. Things are changing too. Yeah. So there's rebuilding going on, so there's replatforming, in some cases complete redos. Yeah. Um, and you got to factor in legacy stuff, which now you got migration tools are getting better. How does that impact your business? Are you guys on that builder side? Are you more on the maintenance side? Where's that action happening? And, and as people start to rethink, yeah. I'm so probably thinking you're on the rebuild side given the traffic and to your booth. Absolutely, I think you know, the way to think about it is that you know, as enterprises are dealing with cloud transformations, modernization, all the AI and the cool stuff that you know, everybody's doing, at the fundamental level, there's still the operability model that you know, we've got to keep it running. And that yeah. has to apply for your data warehouses, <laughs> for your data lakes, and your lake houses. And I think you know, as long as you can provide that central cockpit view to the data enterprise, I think you know, you're still going to be extremely interesting. So you mentioned that you were predicting that the amount of data would increase 2x, and now we're, we're seeing 4 to 5x. Is that reflected in your customer funnel? Absolutely. You know, not just in our customer funnel, but you know, the amount of upsell and cross-sell that we are doing of our own products and of our own offerings within our existing customer base. We start with one department, we go to the enterprise within 18 months, and this is unheard of you know, from a sales you know, momentum perspective. Yeah. The Congrats. kind of funnel growth that we've seen in the last 18 months is just unprecedented. You know, this is sixth year of the business, but you know, last 18 months has just taken off. You guys are doing great. I want to ask about Databricks because that's mm -hmm. the show we're here. You're on the floor, you're getting some good traction. Yeah. How, how is that platform evolving with you and, and how are you evolving with them? Because they're actually adding more stuff in, Lakeflow, Unity's open source. There's a lot, a lot of builds, a lot of open source action. They're trying to make that go faster. What's your connection with Databricks? Explain the relationship. So I have a lot of you know, awareness of the Databricks team because you know, when I was in my previous job at Hortonworks, we used to interact with this team very often, so I know exactly the <laughs> DNA of this you know, leadership and company. They got Hive going in there yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, they have everything. Hive Metastore is now Unity Catalog, yeah. and it's great that they've yeah. just open sourced the entire yeah. thing. I think the way to think about uh, you know, Spark and Databricks is that it's going to be a, a crucial component for enterprise compute. 
you know, it provides great flexibility. It, you know, brings out a huge community of data engineers, not just, you know, BI analysts and SQL writers. And I think, you know, they're doing a great job in integrating these two worlds together. So I think, you know, from a fundamental abstraction perspective, this is an important data processing framework. I want, to ask, I want to ask you a question. We brought this up in the analyst segment because we're, we're seeing with customers on our research side that there's a bifurcation of budgets right now. Mm -hmm. Last year they borrowed from other budgets to fund Gen AI. This year the budgets are really mainly being approved for Gen AI kind of overall growth. Other budgets mm -hmm. that don't have an AI impact are getting some help but not a lot of approval. So you start to see that. The question is, where's the line between data, data analytics that falls into the not relevant bucket and what, where's the line, because there's a gray area between what's truly yeah. going to accelerate generative AI and what is kind of like maintenance mode. Like, because you can look at some data analytics and say, well, where is that? What would, what's your reaction to that? How would you? So I think you know, where the focus is right now in the generative AI world is completely on the unstructured data, but it is moving very quickly to the structured data side, and I think you know, it is happening in small pockets, which is, can we actually go and predict some KPIs and look at you know, what these KPIs will be six months out? And there's also the element of the non-generative AI which is getting implemented on the structured data side. I think the, the, it will be a while before people realize that you know, they're ready for it. That's a place where Accelerator plays a big role, that you know, get your data housed in order. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you won't get garbage out you know, for the garbage that you have, but you're going to get disasters out. Um, I think it'll be about 18 months before we see realistic yeah. outcomes of generative AI, but the investments have to start yeah. today. Yeah, you got to start the infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> what are some of the use cases that you're seeing in this in in this flood of customers that are coming through? Are there some trends, consistency, verticals, or is it across the market? I think you know if you were to broadly bucket it, you know revenue capture, revenue leakage, you know compliance mm -hmm. and finance, you know financial reconciliation, those are like top three, four use cases. Obviously, system reliability, no downtime, those things you know continue to be the same case. I think you know this world is no different than the application development or the APM world. You know, for us, data observability is equivalent to what you know, APMs did for applications. You know, mm -hmm. Just give them more reliability. What's interesting is that uh, you mentioned data engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been speculating that data engineering persona will grow faster mm -hmm. with a lot more engineering going on around the foundation, hence the data lakes. As data strategy comes into play, um, data engineers are going to be actively involved in that. How does yeah. that change the, the career path? Because with AI and now agents coming, we're going to see AI being infused into the data pipelinings and managing a lot of in the 100%. weeds details. You agree with that? Okay, what's the role of the data professional now that who has to be involved in engineering, but also being on the business side, because as agents come online, it's almost like they're an app developer at the same time. So what's your thoughts on this new persona evolution of the data engineering? It's extremely interesting. So what's going to happen is that you know, the data engineers will continue to be you know, the masters of the data that gets fed into the models, but you know, the application developers or the users of that same data on the consumption side, they will be able to put you know, very quick applications for their own consumption. So for example, if you look at, let's say, a forecasting model that has to be put together, you already have the agent, you just have to point it to the data set that you have. So I think you know, the speed or the time mm -hmm. to insight will reduce dramatically. But you know, it'll be at least 18 months, like I said, even before. So data pipelines are essentially going to be like almost procedure calls, if you will, to oversimplify it. It I will mean, get declarative. It's going to be an operating yeah. environment where yeah. the pipelines are going to be really critical. I mean, that's the whole th thesis and the premise of Excel data, that you know, data pipelines are the lifeblood of the organization, supplying both structured and unstructured data. You know, that space itself will start evolving. The integrations will become easier. And you know, I think a lot more data will go through those pipelines. All right, here's a, here's a, little, bit of a little bit of a fantasy kind of scenario. Sure. Maybe we can play with this riff up with it. Is this your data fantasy the, right the, here? The agents come along, uh -huh. they're going to start to do things. Yes. So, generative AI is a runtime-like environment. It generates things. So do you see a day soon where pipelines will be generated automatically based on some deterministic or some programmable way? In other words, the developers can code Gen of AI, but at any given time, a new pipeline might have to be built instantly, provisioned, connected, and built. It is absolutely possible, and I'll, I'll draw out a scenario for you. Yeah. Let's say that you do an acquisition of another company and there's a bunch of data that has just come in, 
and you would be able to you know, go and spin up all the consumer data from that database and bring it to the central data platform, <laughs> it's totally possible. So provided you have the right governance model, provided you understand the operational metadata and the intricacies of you know, what's the cadence at which you should insert the customer data, you have the right observability on the objects that you're trying to merge. Well, double down on that. What are, yeah. what are the prerequisites for that scario? Yeah. I think it's not fantasy, sounds like it's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. What are the yeah. prerequisites to make that happen? So first of all, you need to understand the usage pattern that you know, who are the users who are using yeah. it, is it permissible, is it restrictive? There are a bunch of you know, compliance requirements that go into monitoring or integrating anything before you actually say, okay, look, all of this is flattened out. Second thing I would say is that, you know, do you even know the operating environments and are they on the same operability planes? If they're not, then you know, what is the integration environment? Where do we integrate all of that? So there's going to be some element of human in the loop, yeah. it's not going to be automated, yeah. but I wish, you know, one it sounds day. like data engineering to me. <laughs> it is data engineering, <laughs> but just that you know it'll become a lot more easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot faster and let people get back to work. Absolutely. Before yeah. you know uh, the uh, the scenario that John mentioned over here, I think you know a lot of acceleration will come in because yeah. of these technologies, as opposed to a complete smooth play out. Yeah, that's why I thought Jensen Wong from NVIDIA on stage is interesting because his whole accelerated computing paradigm is the underpinnings that's going to fuel a lot more cap horsepower. So, you know, even Ali uh, Databricks is saying, hey, let the best engine win. I mean, he's probably referring to compute engine or any kind of engine. So, okay, that j accelerated computing is going to come to an acceleration mm -hmm. of data. Absolutely. That data layer. Now, real time is never not talked about much here, because maybe it's a little bit downstream, but real time is important too. What's your view of how real time data is managed in uh, the, new, the new landscape? I think you know, things will certainly accelerate because you know, if integration becomes easier, then you know, getting data to the right endpoints becomes easier, for sure. You know, that's like a simple strategy. But I think you know, I'm also equally excited about the quantized models because when the quantized models really start hitting home, the, specific, the use case specific quantized models will become extremely valuable. So you'll have an accounting model, you'll have an HR model, mm -hmm. and those will become equally powerful and you don't need really GPUs for that. So we've been calling that specialty models on, yeah. and, and I think we actually coined the term small language models in the That's key, right. about a year ago, and they brought up on stage. So that was a big part of the keynote this morning, Savannah, yeah. was small language models, which we've been riffing on the mm -hmm. cube. And our special one, they're, they're domain specific or data Absolutely. specific. They're basically saying, don't discount those. Of course, you would agree with that because you're in the pipeline business. I think we all agree with that. What is, what is the scenario for the small language models? Will they be codified? Will they be wrapped in software? How do those language models learn how to interact with and fuse with maybe other data sets yeah. in, in a generative way? I think it'll follow the pattern that you know, we've seen in other industries as well, that there's going to be a generic enough model and then there's going to be specific fine tuning mm -hmm. that the enterprise will have to do with their own data sets and only then it becomes useful. The key things to note over there are, you know, can you use the data that you're trying to train it on? Are the outcomes you know, supplying the kind of outcomes that you're generally looking for? What's sort of you know, the drift on the data that you were training it on and this the is the state of the business the same that it was, say, three months back? It's an exciting time. I'm curious, since you get to see a lot of different things and talk mm -hmm. to a lot of different companies, taking off your cell data hat and just as a human, what excites you most about the next 18 months? I think life is going to get a lot more simpler. You know, we won't have to call people for appointments. I'm just looking for that day when you know scheduling becomes so much more easier. But I think you know, I'm also equally excited about things like cancer research. You know, just applying the models on you know the hundreds and thousands of X-rays that are already available. You know, finding you know tumors early. Possibly there are like acceleration in molecules and chemicals and Medicare. You know, I think you know there are like a host of possibilities that are ahead of us. And I think you know, compute was a big factor in analyzing all the, you know, the x-rays for tumor detection for early symptoms of you know, people who suffer from cancer. I think you know, those are some really exciting fields. Uh, yeah. Are we going to do more in space exploration and being able to you know, find more galaxies because we can now process more data and you know, images? First we got to get on Mars first. Let's get on Mars. <laughs> I don't know, we <laughs> might find there's a cooler place to go even outside of Mars, who yeah. knows? We, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of possibilities with high performance computing getting to where it's at. Yeah. And yeah, I'm excited. We're going to be living longer, happier, healthier lives. And I hope so. And yeah. yeah, well, I'm putting that out there. I'm manifesting it. That's, uh, that's at least what I'm trying to the do. The first thing I'll give up is, you know, end-to-end -end driving. If, if, you know, AI is reliable, I'm not going to drive anymore. Ex well, exactly. And it, it was, you know, GM was a part of the keynote yeah. yesterday and, and, and with the goal of, as a company, zero collisions, obviously it should be a goal for all of us. But to your point, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, Lyft is already as close as we can get. Yeah. But I would test those models in India, by the way. What's next for you guys? What's on your roadmap? Put a plug in for the company. 
are you guys hiring? What's the business like? Uh, what's the strategy? What's on your to-do list? Yeah, I think you know the first thing that we're trying to do is to inform the enterprise that you know you're going to exist in this changing world for the longest time. Have an operating model. Put the right tools and the views in place. Mm -hmm. Get yourself the right level of visibility so that you can take early action. Enable your data engineers to actually spend less time on production issues and send them away to do generative AI stuff. <laughs> you know, give this work to us. You know, obviously because that's a plug. I think I'm really excited about you know how this world will play out in a multi-tech, multi-cloud scenario. I put a I put a post on my LinkedIn, um, inspired by John Kreis, a former HortonWorks employee, about what lessons learned from the Hadoop days now in our days and. I just threw it out there and actually got a lot of... You've been getting some mileage, mileage out of that, baby. Well, everyone came out, because we've been in this for 14 years, we've been part of that movement. Same question, since you were at Hortonworks, what, what's, what, have we, what have we learned from Hadoop and where are we seeing that? Is it the simplicity, is it the operations? Because Hadoop was right on, it's just that, was it for not crossing over into data analytics? What was the, what did we learn from Hadoop that's being solved now that we can ensure it, confidence? Yeah, this is the third or fourth time I'm referring to. I think the biggest problem with Hadoop was the operations. It was just too difficult to manage. And I'm worried that the modern enterprise has taken on so much that they won't be able to manage these X number of platforms and Y number of use cases. So I think, you know, the successful enterprise, and back then, you know, even if you look at the Hadoop world, the most successful enterprises figured the operations very early. They applied the best data engineers, they, you know, threw millions of dollars into the operability budget and got it working. I think you know all enterprises will have to start thinking in terms of you know their operability model. Once you get ahead of that, then you know you know this is a a jigsaw puzzle. One solution, one platform is not enough. For real time, you'll have another platform. For data science, you'll use another one. For generative AI studio, you'll do something else. For data preparation, there's going to be another model. For batch processing of data, you still need low-cost compute, which probably is on-premise. You have compliance and regulatory needs. It is going to be a multi-tech, multi-cloud yeah. world. It's complex. It is complex. Mm. But it's You're, a lot of fun. We're all working to decrease that complexity, though. All right, Roy, last question for you, That's so right. that we can play it as a highlight before you're on the show next time, since you're now a uh, favorite return guest. What do you hope to be able to say at the next Databricks and Data and AI Summit next year that you can't yet say today? Well, you know, I would like to say that 50% of the Fortune 500 companies are working with us. <laughs> Love I wish it. I could say that. <laughs> well, we're gonna, we're, you're going to manifest that. I'm going to make sure that AI helps us live happier, healthier lives, and we're going to continue our coverage. Rohit, thank you so much for being here. It's been thank absolutely so fantastic. John, yeah. always a pleasure. And thank all of you for tuning in to our fantastic two days of coverage here at Databricks Data and AI Summit in San Francisco, California. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.